Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this Lean Publishing podcast, I'll be interviewing Jeff Leak. Jeff is Associate Professor of Biostatistics and Oncology at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland. He is also co-director of the Johns Hopkins Specialization in Data Science, the largest data science program in the world that has enrolled more than 1.76 million people. He writes for the blog Simply Statistics and can be found on Twitter at Simply Stats. Jeff is the author of the LeanPub book, The Elements of Data Analytics Style. His book is focused on the details of data analysis that sometimes fall through the cracks in traditional statistics classes and textbooks. In this interview, we're going to talk about Jeff's professional interests, his book, his experiences using LeanPub, and ways we can improve LeanPub for him and other authors. So thank you, Jeff, for being on the Lean Publishing Podcast. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I usually like to start these interviews by asking people for uh, more or less their origin story. Um, do you think you can tell me how you first became interested in biostatistics and what led you to where you are? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, at the time uh, that I got first got interested in biostatistics, I was an undergraduate student actually at Utah State University out west, and I was studying mathematical ecology. So I was studying how mountain pine beetles outbreaks, uh, how they're coordinated and how they attack trees. So it's actually kind of a major problem. You read about it in National Geographic a lot about how these mountain pine beetles are sort of devastating huge swaths of the forests out in the western United States. And so when I first started working uh, as an undergraduate student, I got a research assistantship where basically I got paid to camp. It was the best job I've ever had, probably including the one I have now, and I like my job a lot. So, um, But I would go out and I would collect these mountain pine beetle outbreak data from basically we'd count how many beetles hit which trees at which time. And then I started analyzing a little bit and got into that. And then at the time, there was a statistician who was on the faculty in the math department where I was working, and he suggested biostatistics. And when I applied to graduate school, I applied to both math departments and biostat departments, and the biostat department seemed like they had happier students, and so I went into biostat, um, it was sort of serendipitous, and then did you know my graduate work in geno- studying genomics, studying human genomes and the data around human genomes, and then um, did a postdoc, and then ended up here as a faculty member. So that was that was how I got started. So beetles is what sort of led to data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually got a question to ask you about that in a minute. But just just before we do that, um, can you explain a little bit about just what biostatistics is for those who might not be familiar with it? Oh, sure, absolutely. So biostatistics is a uh, field that applies the ideas of statistics, which is basically statistics you might have heard of or you might think of as this boring subject. I often hear that when I tell people hit parties or whatever, but it's actually quite a fascinating subject. It's basically how do you take a small amount of information or a large amount of information um, in the form of data and turn it into you know, some kind of knowledge you can use, whether that's through a clinical trial and trying to decide if a drug works or whether it's analyzing the human genome and trying to figure out which genetic variants are associated with which diseases. Or now more, even in more modern sense, how do you decide which links will people click on on a website? You know, all of that is data. And so statistics is involved in analyzing that data and trying to figure out answers to questions. Biostatistics mostly applies to um, how do you do that in the context of clinical trials? How do you do that in the context of images of, say, your brain or your heart? Or how do you do that in the context of basically data we've collected about your genome? So it's how do you take that information that we collect and turn it into, you know, decisions about your health? So that's what we, uh, what I've been working on for a oh. long time. Okay, okay. Can you give me an example of how, you know, biostatistics would be used in oncology? Yeah, so a, a really common example is, so you might want to detect, for example, there are certain genetic variants that if you have them, certain chemotherapies work better for you. So we, we know that if you have certain variations in your genome, then certain kinds of chemotherapies that target those variations will work better. And so how do we, how do we figure that out? Basically through a statistical analysis. We took a whole bunch of patients, figured out how they responded to chemotherapy, measured stuff about their genomes, tried to associate those two things together and filter out which are the parts that give us information about how does that chemotherapy work. And so... That's one example. There's a lot of other examples. You know, every time you hear about, you know, if you ever read uh, in the news that some new drug has been approved by the FDA, that was the result of a biostatistician analyzing the data set that looked at, they did a trial, they randomized some people to get the drug, some other people to get a different drug, and then a statistician analyzed that data and tried to detect which one worked better. And so that question, that decision is made by a statistician. And so that happens a lot, not just in oncology, but in sort of every aspect of human health. Great, great. Thanks. That's a great answer. Um, Just just back to the uh, mountain pine beetle for a moment. Um, I actually, I used to, when I was an undergrad, my my summer job was um, for the spring season was tree planting in British Columbia. So I spent a lot of time in camps 
also just love that very much, you know, paid to be outside working, right. working in the mountains. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to ask you, I'm sure you still still follow it, but um, what, what's the current state of affairs there? And just for anyone listening, um, you know, it's been truly devastating um, to the forests um, up in sort of the north northwest, you can say, of the United States and sort of, you know, the sort of southwest of, of Western Canada. Um, there's these be- beetles, yeah, that are going just sort of going through from west to east, sort of devastating forests. Um, like, you know, one hears stories about, you know, areas the size of Germany kind of thing being de- right. being devastated. Um, and yeah, can you can you tell me what the current state of affairs is with with that? Yeah, I mean, as I do follow it mostly not as a researcher now, but mostly as a, you know, an uh, interested amateur. But I do know that. So I grew up in Idaho. I still go back uh, to the Northwest a lot to see my family and, and so forth. And you go into you'll go into, you know, the Sawtooth National Recreation Area is a great place to go. But you'll go into parts of the Sawtooth National Recreation Area. And now all the trees are either gray or red because they've just been, you know, huge swaths of the forest have been knocked out. And so uh, I think it's it's not going as well as you would hope. It's going pretty badly, I think, um, in the sense that as the you know as temperatures are warming, the beetles get more and more habitat that they basically can survive in. And so as that's happening, you're sort of seeing them sweep across. It's moving more and more north into Canada, actually. So like there was already quite a bit of damage in the United States, and now more and more you're seeing it in Canada, actually, because basically the climate is becoming conducive to the, the pine beetle surviving there. So um, I think that it's a it's a pretty serious ecological problem that I don't know as far as I know there's no solid answer to how, how to resolve the the mountain pine beetle problem because at least at the time when I was doing the research basically the only way to prevent the beetles from taking out a tree was to spend quite a bit of money I think it was a, maybe a few dollars a tree or something like that to spray the tree down in order to prevent the beetles from coming there and uh, that's not an exp- you know that gets pretty expensive when you're talking about areas the size of Germany right so yeah. They, so I don't know. I mean, uh, again, now I'm just an interested amateur. You'd have to ask the researchers in the field, but I do all the maps I see and all the times I go visit those those areas. It's it's pretty grim right now. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, uh, I'd heard. I'd heard. I'd heard. The last thing I'd read had been better news, but I do. I do know that you know in the lore, you know, on the ground, it was um, you know, a cold winter is what you need. A really cold winter. Oh, and that is happened. You need. So I haven't heard anything yeah. this year. Yeah. Well, no. Not. Yeah, yeah. I just know anecdotally that we had a cold winter up 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 in up in Western Canada, anyway. So, oh well, hopefully that's true. I, that'd be yeah. very good. To, like, I mean, the last I heard about it was like uh, like last year. I read a report, I think, in National Geographic, and it was sounding pretty grim. But oh no, that could have been the way National Geographic was portraying it too. Yeah. I don't know. Well, speaking actually, you mentioned you mentioned you know you're sort of you're you're a scientist and you're you're sort of watching this, um, you know, just at, not as a researcher but just as someone interested. And you had a blog post recently on Simply Statistics about that. Actually, um, you cited um, John Stewart talking to talking to someone. I think it was a physicist who was asked to comment yeah. about you know c- uh, climate change or um, uh, fossil fuels or something like that. Can you explain a little bit what you were getting at in that? Because it was a really interesting post. Yeah, so um, it, it, I think it was Lisa Randall was the physicist that that Stewart was talking to, and and he asked her, um, you know, basically why ha- why haven't we solved the fossil fuel crisis? She's a, a physicist, a quite a theoretical physicist, and she, I thought, answered the question as about as well as you could possibly answer it by saying that, you know, while she knows a lot, she's clearly very well qualified. That's not her area of expertise, and she couldn't answer that question. And so, I think that's one thing that is it's a current problem in society that it's very hard to tell the credentials of somebody. You hear so-and-so PhD, but what does that mean? You could get your PhD in a lot of things, right? And just because you have your PhD in literature doesn't mean you're qualified to tell people about their health or, or you know, I wouldn't be qualified to tell anybody anything about history necessarily. Um, and so I call it residual expertise where it's sort of you get your main expertise and then you look kind of expert to everybody else just by virtue of the fact that you're a PhD or an MD or whatever. And I think it's that, that sort of residual expertise is being used in lots of different political ways now. And I think that's kind of an interesting, you know, whether it's you line up experts against some idea you don't like, whether it's, you know, evolution or whether it's the link between autism and vaccines or whatever it is, the best way to get experts "Quote unquote experts to talk about your your idea in whichever way you want is to pick people that aren't necessarily expert in that area, and then you know you can kind of they don't know as much they might not their opinions might not be as well formed so I, I that's why I, I hesitate to try to I try to qualify when I say things that aren't in my scientific area of expertise 
just so that they don't get interpreted as like, I, I don't actually have expertise in the area of mountain pine beetles now. I, I can tell you only but what I read in National Geographic, you know? So, yeah, I know. I understand. It's it's actually really, I mean, I really take your point there. And um, one, of, one of the more, I mean, from, from my perspective, one of the more pernicious examples I see of that is people who've been successful in business and then claim expertise uh, in the economy. Um, right. And, you know, the, running a business and understanding the economy are actually completely different things. Right. Um, and, and, but, but nonetheless, because money's involved in both, um, people associate, you know, kind of managing a group of people who are doing work, um, right. with, the, with understanding like interest rates <laughs> and, right. and currency valuations, you know? And certainly that's true. The, the more that you can draw any kind of a common thread between what you used to do before and what you're trying to talk about, the more people will believe, you, you know, like being a data scientist right now, you know, in the sense that I analyze data, a very particular type of data, but could very easily try to adapt that to a, very, a bunch of different, <laughs> similarly, you know, people that deal with money could, you know, lots of things deal with money. You may mm -hmm. know more or less about some of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about the the example of business people in the economy, but I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's 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 very. I, I used to um, I used to be an investment banker, and and it's very it's very frustrating to me to see people kind of who 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 are managers play the role of of being economists. It's just not right. it's not the same thing at all. Um, but uh, but yeah, but moving on, um, I wanted to ask you on, on on when it comes to data analysis. Um, in your book, you right. say um, data analysis is at least as much art as it is science. And I was wondering right. if you could explain what you meant by that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um. So it's it's very interesting to me, you know, when you learn about data analysis uh, in school, typically you learn it in the context of, say, an, a statistics class or maybe uh, the end of an econometrics class or something like that, where they, they start to teach you how to actually work with real data. So usually you learn, you know, it, it comes kind of from the history of the field. You, as, a, as a field, it, statistics and, and analyzing data kind of grew out of very mathematical fields. And so there's this idea that you can always write down an equation for how the data are going to behave. And that's almost never true. <laughs> the data is the data that you get out of almost any system is complicated and there's all sorts of reasons why it's messed up. But an example would be from the pine beetle case, there was a day I slept in, don't tell my old bosses, and missed the counts for that day. And so, you know, you put in you the way you would mark it is you just put NA or whatever, but then somebody going back and analyzing that data has to account for the fact that, you know, a graduate student slept in that day which is not something you can nicely model with an equation or anything like that. You just have to deal with the fuzziness of, of the data. And so whenever those sorts of things happen, you have to make lots of basically arbitrary decisions. Do you skip that day? Do you try to impute the missing values using some information, predict what they were? Do you, you know, what, what, what decision do you make about that is basically a human behavioral choice. And it depends a lot on where you were trained, you know, certain mm. Places will like if you went to school at a certain place, they'll tell you to do one thing. Hmm. And if you went to school at a different place, you probably got taught to do something else. And so, and it also, and also just your own perception. And so that's the art of data analysis. Basically, anything beyond there's these beautiful equations that you can use to describe how a linear model fits, or you know any of the standard statistical uh, ideas of what, how to calculate a p-value, the central limit theorem, all that. But in real data, most of it is these series of somewhat arbitrary decisions that mostly you only learn how to make them well after having had experience doing it. It's interesting that that seems to be a theme. Um, I mean, in, in your book, I mean, it's, it's addressed uh, to, you know, kind of trying to find standards for, for, you know, dealing with issues like that. And you, you have a section on a really interesting section called um, common mistakes. Um, right. And one of those in one subsection, you write about the conflation of inferential and causal analysis and spurious mm -hmm. correlations and causation creep. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if you could go into a little bit about what causation creep is and why it's a problem. Yeah, so there's a few ideas packed in there. They're all related to each other, though. So causation creep is usually when you're analyzing a data set, it's very hard to, even if you find that two variables have related, the data is related. Say a, a very common, the most common example of this is if you plot the, you know, how many ice cream cones people buy and how many murders occur in a city those two things will be correlated with each other in almost every city in the world. And mm. so that's not because ice cream eating causes murderous intent or anything like that, right? It's just because in the hot months, people will 
uh, eat more ice cream and they'll also more murders occur in hot months because people are out and they're interacting more or whatever. So that's an example where there's a correlation between those two variables, but you can't say that ice cream eating causes murder. <laughs> and so similarly, in almost any analysis you do of data, say in the medical field, if you don't take very careful steps, you can detect correlations between all sorts of variables. Like, do you want uh, a headline I saw once was Facebook causes cancer? You know, you, you, you read a lot of Facebook, so you'll get cancer. That's probably not true. They probably just analyzed this gigantic data set that wasn't carefully curated and found a correlation and reported it. And so what the way that that happened likely is the original authors of the study probably were very careful not to say that it was a causal relationship that Facebook causes cancer. They probably said something like, you know, we observed a correlation between Facebook and, and cancer in this population. But then somebody, either them or maybe the editor in an editorial wrote, well, it looks like Facebook might cause cancer. And then somebody else says Facebook causes cancer. You know, it, like you can see the progression of the language from, oh, we observed an interesting correlation to this causes that. So that's kind of causal creep is, at least as I define it, is basically the creeping of causal language into a description of an analysis that really can't tell you which one caused which. I and imagine. So, yeah. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, I imagine um, reading the sort of popular sort of science news sections on websites must really be frustrating for you because that, those, those stories seem to be, I mean, you know, half of them seem to be based on that kind of journalist just taking the opportunity to say something you know, that they, based on some research that they kind of read a summary of. Yeah, I think that's certainly frustrating. And the one thing that's been really frustrating is as a, a parent, so I have two young children and, um, you know, there's always news about if you do this for your kids or do that for your kids, they'll be fine or they'll be, you know, they'll turn into malformed mutants or whatever it is. And so, you know, if you don't know how to like look into the details of the study, then you can be snowed by a, like information that clearly isn't true. You know, one of my favorite pet peeves is sort of this often discussed connection between breastfeeding and IQ. You know, if you breastfeed your kids for longer, they'll have higher IQs. But that's one of these notoriously hard things to study well because it's very hard to randomize women to breastfeed or not breastfeed. And so you often will see claims about breastfeeding that are based on observational data, which is data that makes it very hard to make real causal claims. And so, you know, that introduces a whole set of ideas that, that, that make it really hard to, to understand what's really happening. But there's a lot of, understandably, a lot of emotion tied to what that answer might be. So that one comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, you also have a section on data dredging um, where you quote the British economist Ronald Coase as saying, um, and I just love this quote, if you torture the data enough, nature will always confess. Um, right. Can you explain what, what he meant by that? Yeah, so it kind of goes back to that same, the, the art idea of data science so, or data analysis. is basically, if you, since most of data analysis boils down to a, a series of sort of basically decisions that have to be made by a human, um, if you're nefarious, for example, if you really want the data to say something, you can make all those decisions in such a way that you'll get the answer you want. Here's an example. Suppose I take um, all the data for... Uh, some two stocks and I want them to be correlated with each other. Like I want the prices to be correlated with each other. But it turns out when I take the data, I look at them, they're not correlated at all. Well, if I take all the observations, all the times where stock one is high and stock two is low and I just throw those out and throw out all the times when stock two is high and stock one is low and throw those out. So now they're, I only have the data points where they're both high at the same time or both low at the same time, then they'll be very correlated. So there's ways in which that's an extreme example, of course, but there's also subtler ways in which you can, by making a lot of, you know, intermediate choices, the final answer you're trying to get, you can arrive at it. So there's sort of a, a, a concern in the community, scientific community, data analysis community, that we're not, we, we need to be careful about knowing what all the intermediate steps were, knowing how many times you fit a predictive model. Did you try every possible combination of variables until you found one that worked? Or did you, you know, very carefully hold out a, a data set to check your predictions on and make sure it worked? And so there's lots of ways in which you can sort of manipulate the data if you're not, um, either if you mean to do it or even by accident. I think the more common reason is not nefarious. It's just by accident. People 
try a bunch of things and then they just stop when it gives them the answer that they want. They weren't trying to be bad. They just got to the answer they wanted. And so they quit. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating, especially as you, uh, you're bringing up stocks. I mean, you know, one of the, you know, the, the, the 2000 tech bubble happened to coincide with um, people having the internet and personal computers and then charts. Um, and if you want to see how creative people can be interpreting data, just give them a stock chart and what let them go. You know, right. it's 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 just incredible to see what people will do, and they'll find they'll find different charts and put them against each other, and you know, you, right. and they'll bring the knowledge that they have of what's going on in the world, and also their interests and their desires to it, and and you know, it's it's just amazing how like if you just described something to somebody, they'd be like, that's an interesting story, but what are the facts? But if you put it in a chart, it's like all in numbers. I mean, nothing nothing confers more validity upon the, the wildest claims than just putting numbers to them right like it's just right. it almost has a magical effect on people and uh, you actually you have you have a line in your book as well or i think on your landing page um where you talk about how through the dramatic change in the price and accessibility of data demands a new focus on data analytic literacy um right. and i was wondering is that is that related to this that that people are exposed to data more than they used to be and so and, and have more you know, again, because of like sort of basically computers, they they can interact with data in a way they couldn't even like thirty years ago. Is that is that what you were getting at, or was it something else? Yeah, there's different different. There's two levels at which I think about that problem. One is exactly what you're talking about, which is that basically a computing free computing even has made it really easy for anybody to make charts of two variables and plot them against each other. And once you do that, inevitably you'll run into some things that will look like there's a relationship even when there's when they're not. So that's certainly the fact that data analysis training isn't something that we give most people, right? Only a certain subset of the population gets trained on how to be aware of the fact that two stocks might look correlated even when they're not, right? So um, we don't teach people that like in grade school. We teach them reading and writing and arithmetic, but then we don't teach them, oh, if you make too many charts, eventually you'll find one that's a false relationship, right? Which is a something we don't teach people, but maybe should. Even more than that, though, I think it's even more subtly ingrained into everything you do in life, even if you don't think about it now these days, more than it used to be. I wake up in the morning and I look at the weather and what it's going to be throughout the day and whether I should bring a raincoat or not. And then I have to make some assign some credibility to whether I believe the app that tells me what the weather is going to be. And so I'm making decisions based on that. Any if you watch any sports games, they're always talking about this is the first person since so and so 1973 to have, you know, this many goals and this many assists at this time, you know, halfway through the first period, right? And so that's the sort of thing that basically you're saturated with people talking about statistics and numbers and trying to exactly like you said, give themselves an aura of credibility by talking about numbers, especially precise numbers. And uh we're not equipped. We haven't been trained in general as a population to be skeptical or to identify what are the potential flaws with those numbers. And I think it allows people to get away with stuff, whether it's in speeches, you know, politicians giving speeches and making wild claims with numbers that if you just step back and think about the actual claim they're making, you think, no way, that's true. <laughs> but they said, oh, it's a 3.2% increase. You think, well, 3.2%, you know, <laughs> they clearly calculated that number when maybe they even haven't, you know, so... I think that's the that's what I mean by that. I think everyone has to do, whether it's from conceptual to making their first charge to whatever, almost everyone is doing some form of data analysis every day now. But we don't have it as part of the standard sort of just daily life curriculum of how do you deal with that is what I, I think I meant. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, but you are, I know you are um, uh, engaged in a pretty like wide effort to to help educate people. I mean, more, more in a uh, sort of people with more specialized or advanced knowledge, but you're doing this through with your colleagues through this specialization in data science on Coursera, uh, right. which, as I said in the introduction, has 1.76 million people um, at last count um, participating yeah. in it. And um, I mean, that's obviously extremely popular. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about the specialization in data science and, and maybe why, what I mean, what it is and, and, and you know, that it's free, for example, and, and, and why, why it's been so such a success. Yeah, I mean, you, I'm just as surprised as anyone else that that many people <laughs> wanted to learn data science. But um, I think we, I remember a very specific conversation with Roger where when we originally launched our first Coursera classes, we were talking to each other and we said, wouldn't it be cool if like 2,000 people took our stats classes? And so obviously we're a couple of order, orders of magnitude bigger than that now. I think 
what has happened is that there are a lot of, so the data science classes cover uh, basically how to use the R programming language to do the whole data analysis, data science process from getting the data to cleaning it up, to analyzing it and making reports. And um, I think it's just there's that skill, that particular skill is in such high demand right now. And it kind of rapidly, uh, it wasn't in demand and became in demand over a very short period of time. And there weren't that many resources available if you didn't know how to analyze data. You could have gone back to school to learn it, or this is one of the first, you know, sort of freely available, always available resources for learning how to do that. So the classes are free. If you want a certificate that you can put on LinkedIn, you pay a small, I think it's like $50 a class or something like that through Coursera to, to, to get the certificate. And so I think the fact that it was really available, the fact that it was timed well, I think got, got people excited about it. But it, it makes me happy that there are lots of people that are interested in learning how to do data analysis and data science, right? So I think the the trend is is positive in the sense that you're seeing people making the decision to learn how to do that. So yeah, I remember I was looking at one of your talks online, um, uh, just some slides, and I think there was a, a you showed an email exchange between yourself and Roger Peng, your colleague, where you know you said I've got seven thousand students, and he replied in in more colorful language, "You're screwed." Um, yeah, and and I was just wondering. I mean, does does the fact that there's 1.76 million people affect your workload, or is you know the is the way Coursera is set up just so efficient that that doesn't really impact anything? It could be you know n people. No, it takes. Um, it definitely affects workload, but maybe not as dramatically as it would if they were in person. You know, uh, first of all, there's. We have uh, the Coursera and us have recruited people from the classes community TAs who are amazing, outstanding folks who answer lots of questions on discussion boards. That helps us answer questions. We answer questions on the discussion boards, but we tend to, at this point, the classes have been running for a long time. So the same questions come up over and over again. So you can kind of anticipate sort of the usual set of questions that will happen. So we have nine classes in the sequence. They all run every single month. So we're getting a lot of data back on which are the parts that are hard, which are the parts that are easy. And we can kind of take advantage of that, I think. Um, and then it isn't quite the same experience. You wouldn't, taking a class online, you definitely don't get as big, a, you know, imagine that many people going through. Each one doesn't get as big a fraction of my attention as, say, when I teach a class here in person for 10 people. It's much easier for me to, like, give everybody personalized attention. That's much harder at scale. And so... You see that just because, just by virtue of there being a lot of people taking it, it makes it harder. So people tend to be work a little bit more independently on the the Coursera platform than I think in person. Okay. So it has added a workload in the sense that Roger Bryan and I didn't think it was going to turn into this huge enterprise, but now that it has, you know, that it's got a life of its own and its own obligations and responsibilities that is added to our lives. But it's been such a kind of a rocket ship that it's been fun to 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 take those on. The yeah. New challenges. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, congratulations on that. I think it's just just yeah. great. Um, and uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask you um, just a couple of questions about LeanPub. Um, so how did you? I'm I'm curious how you found out about LeanPub and why you chose to use it for for your book. So I think it was uh, uh, Brian Caffo actually who uh, led it. So Brian's a colleague of mine that teaches in the same specialization. He was. Uh, writing a book and was looking around for the right place to do it, and he's kind of a tools a tools geek, so he's always checking out like what's the latest, coolest, easiest, or hardest, or whatever way to do something. And he got really into LeanPub, so um, he wrote his book and released it first on LeanPub. And um, we wrote all of our lectures actually in Markdown, like for the specialization. So we were all really comfortable with Markdown, oh, okay. and so he said, "I found this awesome." Tool LeanPub, you can write in Markdown. You can even take some of the material from your lecture notes and convert it more easily into like the start of a book chapter. And um, and then he told us about how I think the the system of how simple it is to write it and turn it into all the different types and then launch the book without having to go through all the usual, you know, all of us have worked on academic books and uh, that publishing process through that can be a bit, you know, long and tedious and everything. So like the speed with which we could do things was very exciting for us. And so he launched his book and it was pretty successful and we were very excited about it. And then uh, I launched mine and Roger launched, launched his and we've all been, you know, just blown away by, we all really liked the 
pub system. We've all been, I don't think any of us will ever go back to publishing <laughs> any other way. So we're pretty excited about well, it. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. And I, I wanted to ask specifically about um, academic publishing and, and I mean, publishing about, about, scientific matters and technical matters i mean the pace of you know it's a bit of it's obviously a cliche to say the pace of change is is accelerating um these days and the the, the pace this like speed with which people can communicate their ideas is changing and do you think that do you think that the conventional academic publishing model which can take i mean it can take a year to get an article in a journal right. um you know just just in a journal um do you think that there's like a fundamental mismatch between those two I mean, yeah, be, be, I, I do think yeah. that there's, and the, right now the way I'm seeing that manifest in the journal publishing way is that people are using preprints pretty extensively. So they're basically, it's very common now, including my group does this a lot. You'll write a paper with a student. You, when you submit it to the journal, you also post it on a publicly facing web server, basically like our, one of the most famous one is archive, a -R -K, uh, kind of an X I V yeah. um, and bio archive is the biology one. And you just post your paper there everybody starts reading it while the paper is sort of being peer reviewed. And so when it's on those, those sites, it's not peer reviewed yet. And so everybody knows to take it with a grain of salt. Things might not be totally worked out yet. Um, but you don't want to put something up there that's embarrassing either. You, you, you have your scientific colleagues, you know, they're all going to read it. So you, you don't just post anything. And then, um, so that, that's improved the speed that way. And then in terms of publishing books, you know, that's still a pretty slow process and a pretty hard process. And it's not clear that, that that's caught up with the internet age either. I think, you know, certainly the publishing policies of academics are, have are very slow adopting internet style communication. And so it's starting to accelerate. I think over the last, I would say over the last three years, I've seen a lot more posting things online, tweeting about it, that sort of thing. But that seems pretty new, you know, that doesn't seem, that hasn't been going on for a long time. It's interesting, yeah, because that 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 process that you're talking about. I mean, in in a way, the most important part of the process is is putting the text out there and then having the community engage with it, whether it's in kind of like a formal peer review through a journal or the informal peer review that happens when when as soon as you post it to archive or I hadn't heard of bio archive before, but yeah. um, and um, I mean, is that like for example with your with your lean pub book was that important to you to have that kind of interaction with people or was that a different type of project i mean i'm obviously not yeah. peer review style engagement but you know just you know people telling you even even something as minor as a typo or i wish you'd written about this or that yeah i definitely i've been getting a huge amount of um especially typos because i you know i we're a bit of a speed has been a hallmark of the things that we've done around here which doesn't mean we always catch every typo so i've gotten a long list of typos which i'm slowly working my way through one thing i like about the platform i'm is that once I get through those, I'm going to release a new version of the book and everybody gets it again. You know, I like that component of the, the, the uh, process is the ability to release it quickly, make edits and not feel like I'm hurting the people that paid for it for, you know, that because mm -hmm. you don't want to release something too quickly. And then it turns out that it wasn't, you know, there are typos and things like that in it. So I mostly, mostly it's just typos so far. Nobody's found any errors. Thank goodness. But, um, it, it, it is something where I do think that the iterative nature of it is nice. It, it makes it a lot easier to feel like you have to put out that perfect product the first time, which is very hard to do, especially for something the length of a book, I find. You know, yeah. you're know, you almost guaranteed to have a few typos in there. And so it's easier when there's a thousand people reading it and checking for typos than if you only have one editor or one person, your friend, looking it over. So. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's that's obviously you know that's our that's our premise, right? That that a better way to write books than than sitting in kind of in stealth mode, you know, working alone in the, in the cabin for a couple of years and then releasing something that's presumed that's supposed to be finished is to just get it out there earlier and start interacting with people and getting their their feedback and comments, and that that actually will improve your book, um, you know, dramatic, yeah, I think, dramatically. I mean, that's certainly been true for that's certainly been true for me. I think we have the advantage, Roger, Brian, and I of already having a kind of a built in large group of people that might be interested in, you know, given that we teach these big classes and the things that we talk about in our books are related to those classes that we kind of have a built in big audience. And so that's made typo identification a very quick <laughs> process <laughs> in the sense that I was very quickly informed of all the typos in the book. Uh, <laughs> and so it's been, I'm the slow, I'm the bottleneck, you know, the identification of the typos wasn't the bottleneck. It's me having time to correct them all and release the new version. And so, 
that I think certainly when you have a built-in audience, especially, it's just so much more efficient to get the typos corrected post publication than than pre publication. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there, um, is there anything about lean pub that we could improve for you? I mean, like, and you, know, you could be, you know, as blunt as you want, like, is there something that had you show? I mean, I, sh- I'm a, I'm the type of person who shouts at the computer when I'm using things and they don't work. I, was there any right. kind of shout at the computer thing about lean pub that you, that you encountered? Um, I didn't have too much. I mean, mine is a little bit easier. I, you might have to, you know, I think maybe some of the code and equation stuff was a little bit more challenging for my friends, Roger and Brian, who had to do more code and equations than I did. Um, the one thing I, I wish LeanPub had was a uh, hard, a really easy hard copy publishing approach. You know, something like CreateSpace style. Right. Yeah. You know, I've gotten quite a few requests now for hard copies of the book, um, and so far I've just been kind of you know deferring that because I haven't had a good approach. And I look at you know I've looked into some other hard copy publishing approaches, and they're not as slick as you know the the thing I liked about LeanPub was how it it made it very easy for me to do, you know, given that we're running these classes on the side and we're professors and we mm-hmm. have all the other things in our lives. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't have a huge amount of time to devote to getting my publishing software to work the way I yeah. want it. To. So, no, fair enough. Uh, that has been maybe the thing that's best, the, the thing I w- wish we could copy for everything we're doing. You know, even we've made suggestions to Coursera and other places about ways they can make their system more lean pub like in the sense that it would be easier for people to upload things and stuff like that. And I think that's certainly true that that is the part that this is the killer feature as far as working. Okay. Is. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. I mean, we do, we, we, we've tried to accommodate that need as, as much as we can without, without actually doing it ourselves by having a print print version output option um, right. that, that's sort of optimized for um, like you just write your lean pub book the normal way, but you can also, you can also export an opt you know a version that's optimized for uploading to like Lulu and things like that. Um, right. You know, I think I think that you know LeanPub getting into the production of paper books thing is like that's a long that's probably a long ways away. Um, I figured. I mean, you know, I, I, even if it was just an agreement where if there was just a push button, you just sent it to one of those organizations instead of us. But like, oh, that's really interesting. I'm saying where you yeah. Don't even have- build the infrastructure yourself but yeah it's a certain amount of yeah and upload then get a new account on this new system right oh that's a bit of a pain um oh that's really interesting thanks so we'll we'll talk about that 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 would actually be that's a really great i mean there's obviously behind the magic you know oh there's gonna be a huge amount of work behind the magic world peace button you know as programmers talk programmers talk about you know the client goes like and now i want a button that causes world peace it's like, well, I can make a button with the words "world peace" on it, but actually, anyway, that's that's a really good suggestion, and 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 I'll take that to the team, and we'll we'll think about it. Um, but honestly, I don't think. I mean, given that that's my only suggestion, you can tell for the most part, I'm very pleased with the platform. Like things went very for me went very smoothly. Um, I didn't. I really didn't have any problems. I'm already starting on my second Lean Pub book, and so I'm sort of. I no, I I find no problems with the platform that's currently created. Yeah, actually, that was going to be my my last question. Was I see that you have an unpublished book called "We Are All Statisticians Now" or "We Are All Statisticians Now"? Is that the book you were referring to? I have that one, and then I so I have like I'm a person that starts things relentlessly, maybe doesn't finish all of them. The one I'm I'm working on mostly right now. I have two. I don't know if it, it should be up here on the Lean Pub site yet. Maybe it's not already up there. But um, uh, the one I'm working on right now is that issue of. How do you deal with health information in your day-to-day life? So my wife and I, we're both statisticians. My wife and I are both statisticians. Oh, okay. So whenever we talk about health headlines, you know, there's a language we use about them, um, how we determine whether we believe, you know, like if it says we should be giving our kid more sweet potatoes or whatever, then there's a series of questions. If I read that headline and I tell my wife, there's a series of questions she'll ask me before she'll believe that it's true. And so we're working on, I'm working on a book. I'm hoping that I can eventually convince her to collaborate with me on it where we um, talk about basically what are the questions that two statisticians ac- ask each other when reading about health news. Mm. And, and so how do you evaluate critically whether the study behind the headline is really something you should be paying attention to or whether you should just ditch it. So that's that's the one that we're working on right now. Okay. That sounds like a really great idea. Um, so, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, uh, thanks, thanks very much for being on the Lean Publishing Podcast and for being sure. a Lean Pub author. All right. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Thanks.